Hello everybody, uh, my name's Vince, uh, Vince Hines. I'm the Managing Director of Wellington. And uh, yes, as Nathaniel mentioned, this uh, is an opportunity for us to lift the lid and look at salaries uh, within our industry, within the profession of project management. Um, so for this um, webinar, I've got a number of slides that I'm gonna walk through. And uh, the structure of this webinar is very much talking about the sorts of people who have been involved in this collecting this data. Then obviously the, the drum roll moment, uh, give you the salary information. But also we're interested in contractor rates as well, uh, not just uh, permanent salaries. Um, also in the survey we asked about market confidence and there's no uh, more critical point in time I think than, than where we are today with that kind of question. Uh, with uh, with Brexit going on. And, uh, and then finally, uh, I've got some more insight for you in terms of um, general uh, advice and guidance about salaries, about careers, about working with agencies as well. Um, so just to explain who the heck I am, so um, I'm the Managing Director, as I mentioned, of Wellington Project Management. We are a project management consulting company. Uh, we, we're based in Windsor. We work with clients across the UK and um, we are a consulting, training, and recruitment company. As part of that, we have some badges. Uh, a very important badge is we are um, an APM corporate member. We're an APM accredited training provider. And uh, so we work very closely with the professional body. And from our perspective, uh, very keen to um, uh, demonstrate best practice. And, um, and of course, the APM is going through an exciting time as well. Uh, there's another logo I just want to mention to you on there that you may have seen before, where it says REC member. Um, that is the Recruitment and Employment Confederation member logo. Uh, and that gives some uh, guarantee of assurance or quality in terms of working with a recruitment agency. That's something I'm going to refer to at the end of this webinar. Um, but uh, that's, that's just a logo I just wanted to point out to you. Um, one of the joys of my job, and this is a genuine joy, is I get to go into lots and lots of different organizations and help them improve their project management maturity, having great staff is part of that journey. Um, there's a, a, a list here of some of our clients, a most eclectic mix possible. The key message across this is project management is in every organization. And uh, most organizations, if not all, are running projects. And most, if not all, can therefore benefit from improving their project management approach. And the only way to do that is the people. And uh, I, I have to admit, I could name, I'm not of course, but I could name household name organizations uh, that are very successful, but frankly their project management is, uh, is not very good at all. And in other surveys that we've done with the APM, particularly the, the APM PMO SIG, um, it's demonstrated that about 30%, 30 to 40% of projects are delivered on time, within budget, at the right price. So there's a, a big room for improvement. Um, so, um, but anyway, let's uh, let's get on with our slides. And um, so, yes, we work closely with the APM, and we do officially sponsor uh, the APM salary survey. Um, as recruitment experts, we're involved in the collation. We're involved in uh, thinking about what the questions should be, um, and of course, the data is very useful for us and all our clients as well. Um, you might also, uh, if you do receive the uh, the project journal, you might also see the. Um, uh, the articles that we have in there and the blog posts as well on the APM website. So, um, so the, the APM Salary and Market Trends Survey 2017. Well, actually, this is the third year now we've been running uh, this survey. It is by far the largest survey in the UK on project management salaries. And this year, the survey really reflects the approach, and I'm, obviously I'm not talking on behalf of the APM here, uh, I'm talking on behalf of Wellington, but uh, I think it's fair for me to say that uh, the APM is keen to have a much broader reach, recognizing that so many people are involved in project management, and um, as part of that, they're also keen to ensure the professionalization of project management, and recently receiving charter, Royal Charter is certainly a great milestone on that journey. So as part of that, not only have the APM themselves asked their members to fill out this survey, but also YouGov have been directly involved as well, widening uh, the, the reach of this survey, broadening the range, getting information from a much wider range of people. Um, and one of the things I would say on that topic is that project management um, 
or the job title project manager, and, and some of you uh, listening here probably will feel the same way, that the job title project manager is possibly one of the most widely abused job titles possible. Uh, lots of people have that job title without really understanding best practice project management. And I always say to people, if you're going to take on a project of any scale, there is a defined way that can increase your chances of success. Uh, and the, the home of that approach uh, arguably is the APM and they have lots of great material out there, lots of guidance, uh, formal qualifications uh, that can help you be more successful. So uh, John McGlynn, APM Chair, we have an intro from him. Hopefully while I've been talking you've uh, had a chance to, to read through that. And there is a real goal here to uh, uh, broaden the profession. Um, so as I mentioned, um, we've been doing this survey now for three three years. If we compare this year to last year, um, certainly again the numbers are up. Uh, nearly some people took part this year against around 5,000 uh, from last year, uh, which itself was quite an increase from the first year, So, which is great. Uh, more people have been involved, uh, more uh, women are involved, 8% more, and, um, and also quite a large percentage of people, uh, a third, have very significant formal qualifications, academic qualifications as well. Now, bear in mind, this survey uh, it was an online survey uh, that people were invited to take part in uh, through to the end of April this year. So, um, uh, the report itself that I'm presenting about is, is not yet published. Uh, this is the first uh, real uh, uh, publication of, of the data, uh, so obviously I'm very pleased to be doing that. And, but it will be published after this webinar. So very soon after this webinar, you'll have the opportunity to download uh, this report from the APM's website, apm.org.uk, or indeed from, from our website, from Wellington, wellington.co.uk as well. Um, so also at the top right-hand corner of the graphic here, you'll see APM 47,500, the national average is 37,500. So uh, I'm gonna talk about more obviously about the, the salary levels and the averages uh, in the next couple of slides, in fact. But just to let you know that we've got data from those people who are APM members or have some relationship with the APM, and I'm going to talk about that shortly. But also we have data from YouGov as well. Um, so therefore we've got a, a broader data set to work from. Okay, um, so who took part? Um, now, in the actual survey that you'll soon be able to, the report that you'll soon be able to download, there is even more information than I'm going to present here. Uh, but what I would say is that the majority of people who took part work for a large organization, 250 employers, employees or more, and 90% of the people who took part are full-time employees, uh, rather than being contractors uh, or, or anything else. I am going to talk about contract rates, uh, but let's look at the, the perm salaries first of all. So uh, this uh, graphic shows us that the range, so if you can, on your left hand side, if you pick your salary, um, and this is base salary, um, and then you can see what percentage of respondents have that salary. Um, the, as I said, the APM uh, average salary is £47,500. Now we could drown ourselves in data, what I would say is possibly the next slide is actually uh, where it gets very interesting because the next slide here tells us there's different salaries for different job titles. Now I've mentioned already the job title project manager uh, is very widely used. Um, so kind of the drum roll moment, this is the slide. Uh, project manager, average salary across the UK, 47 and a half thousand pounds. Uh, program manager, which is often obviously perceived as a more senior role, or portfolio manager, uh, share the same level at £62,500. And I'm not going to go through the full list, but some key things I do want to point out on this slide, and we're probably going to spend a little bit of time talking about this slide. The first is, in the career of a project manager, it potentially is quite natural to feel that someone might start as a project administrator or coordinator then turn into an assistant project manager, and then hopefully uh, become a project manager. The key difference with those roles, I always say to people, is level of responsibility. You know, I'm the project manager, it's got my name on it, and I'm responsible for delivering that on time, within budget, 
for the right level of quality, hopefully delivering the benefit that we all thought we were going to get at the beginning. So project manager, 47,500 pounds. Last year, uh, same job title, uh, the average was 46,000 pounds. So woo -hoo, we've got a slight increase there. Um, but what is interesting, I always find interesting, is actually, um, and this has, been, this has been true for, the, for all the surveys, is that a change manager, the average salary of a change manager is higher, 55,500. Now that's gone up. Um, and gone up it by a much greater margin because last year it was fifty-one thousand um, pounds. There's definitely a recognition of the need to uh, manage change, particularly with large business transformation projects. A lot of our clients are doing uh, big business change uh, projects, and therefore the recognition that to increase the likelihood of success, we need someone who's an expert in change management. Now you can always argue, of course, and quite rightly too, that a project manager is that role is about managing change. Uh, but if you're thinking about in terms of career prospects, it's certainly an interesting proposition to suggest that if you moved into being a pure change manager, which is a subtly different but goodness me highly linked role, um, the, uh, the, the salary rates seem to be slightly higher for that particular type of expert. Um, and then if we moved on further and said, well, what's kind of the next role that one you could have for the slightly higher salary, then the, um, about the sixth one down or so, program or project office manager, 57 and a half thousand pounds. Again, that's up from last year. Last year it was 54,000 pounds. So again, quite a, a good increase. And, and I, one of the things I always say to people, giving them some career advice is, don't just think it's about running projects. Project management and the profession of project management isn't just about those people who run projects. It is also about those people who provide that project management infrastructure um, in, for, the, for organizations. And I'm using the term infrastructure. Uh, that's the term used by the, um, the, in the APM uh, body of knowledge. Um, infrastructure is the, often called the PMO project management office, portfolio office, program office. And that role is there, as projects start and finish, that role is there, that entity is there, providing lots of guidance, potentially assurance, and so on. So running a program office or a project office, I always say to people who are running projects, actually have a look at going into that type of role and then go back to running projects possibly at a later point. Um, a very good head of project office needs to have walked the path of running projects. So, um, so that is again a, a, an opportunity as for a, uh, a salary increase um, in the right organizations. Uh, the PMO um, has an opportunity to, to um, earn more money there, 57 and a half thousand pounds. I have to say the one that sticks out and it sticks out even on this slide is the very fortunate company director or board member. Now, uh, the salary there, £125,000. Uh, very nice indeed, thank you very much. Uh, last year, that was £90,000. So, uh, some big increases there, uh, possibly percentage-wise more than any other category. Um, there's one category that actually did drop, uh, portfolio manager. Uh, last year, we had an average of £66,000. Um, and um, I, 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 this may explain possibly the, the wider pool of people who've now been involved in this survey. Um, I do find in a lot of organizations that job title possibly doesn't exist, or if it exists, it, it, it exists at a very strategic level, managing the portfolio of projects, aligning them with corporate strategy. Um, so often that, for me, is, should be quite a, a very senior role. Um, and of course, it's one of the highest paid roles here as well. So um, on average then, as I said, we've got a project manager, 47,500. And, um, uh, and I would agree with that. As, as someone now I'm going to put on my hat as, as an owner of a recruitment consultancy, I would say that fits exactly where we would expect it to be. Of course, there is uh, variation by region and of course by industry. Um, so I think you know, my first challenge to you is to say, well, what, you know, which of those job titles have you got? Where do you sit compared to those um, averages? So um, hopefully no massive surprises for you, but let's look at it. Let's split it down by two different criteria, location, region, and uh, age as well. Um, the age one, I, I always find this very interesting because effectively almost perm salaries, and I'm focusing on the blue here, 
from those who have uh, filled it in, uh, filled in the survey, um, who have either a membership of the APM or some involvement with the APM. Those salaries there, 27,500, 37,500, 47,500, and so on, um, they, they almost go step hand in hand with age. Um, the, uh, in, within each, each age bracket, um, the, uh, the salary almost mirrors uh, the highest age of those brackets. Um, and of course, we have regional variation. It goes without saying. Interestingly, uh, London uh, always seen as the uh, the most expensive place to live. Um, potentially, the the salary average there is pretty static from last year, fifty five and a half thousand pounds. Where we have seen an increase, very close to that, is the southeast. Um, so the southeast salaries are catching up or have caught up, uh, absolutely caught up. And again, that possibly reflects the. Um, uh, expense of living in those areas as well. Regional variations, uh, Northern Ireland is another one where we've seen an increase, a good increase from last year, which is excellent. Um, but there's pretty much uh, as they were last year. So again, you could, uh, of course, this is average salaries for the job title uh, project manager. So so um, we can see the, the variation by region and we can see it by age. So again, you might say, well, where do I sit? And uh, how old am I? And uh, am I doing better than my peers or not? Um, the next slide then, again, recognizes this broader range of people who have been involved in this survey. And we have uh, the data split by, in the top bar there, APM members. And uh, the bottom there, it says APM affiliates. And um, the term affiliate does have a new connotation with the APM at a corporate level. So it's possibly better for me to talk about people who are not members. This is individuals who are not members of the APM, uh, but have had some sort of interaction uh, with them, um, possibly say done a, completed a, an APM qualification um, or have uh, been involved in a, um, a, an APM event or something like that rather than that middle uh, light blue band, which um, is for that wider uh, group of people uh, through YouGov who've been involved, who took part in this survey. So uh, APM members, well, APM members seem to do the best. And um, if we look at how many of those uh, are on those higher salaries, uh, there's a good broad range. And um, uh, the data speaks for itself. I don't think I need to read that out to you, uh, but um, uh, the average salary is 55,500. Uh, obviously, that drops down for APM, uh, those who have an involvement with the APM, 47,500. And, and, and I think that, that middle band it gives uh, some explanation as to why some of the averages, and you'll see this particularly so on the contract rates, have dropped. I think it's dropped because there's a much wider group of people being involved in the survey. Um, and, and you can see the average from that wider pool is lower. Now, you could argue, therefore, being a member of the APM uh, increases your salary. Um, it, it, it's cart and horse, isn't it? Which one comes first? But certainly, uh, being someone who recognizes the profession, engages with the profession, that's probably a good thing for your career. I mean, I always say to people, you know, if you want project management to be your job, your career, um, wouldn't you go and get the qualifications? Wouldn't you go and see what the industry has to offer? Wouldn't you go and embrace uh, the industry? Uh, I don't want this to turn into the advert for the APM, but they do uh, hundreds of events every year, um, split by region uh, in chapters. There's a London branch near me. Um, there's a Thames Valley branch again near me. Um, and also split them by specific interest groups. And uh, so each of those specific interest groups have conferences and events as well. Um, the, I guess some of the groups that we work most closely with include the APM, PMO, SIG, um, and uh, Women in Project Management have a huge conference every year. Uh, men are invited, and um, and I was at their conference, um, their last conference, uh, and it was a fantastic event. Hundreds of, of people there. Uh, it's a real opportunity to network, and um, and of course that networking involved getting involved in your industry can potentially lead to career opportunity as well. So um, certainly, um, I would embrace membership. And uh, so that's employee employees and their rates. Let's look at um, day rates, uh, people in a contract or interim uh, role. Again, a very broad range. 
A uh, couple of things I want to point out here is that at the lower end of the scale, so less than 200 pounds, there's a lot more people who took part in the survey on that lower end of the scale. And in fact, if we compare 17%, uh, which is the figure for this year, with last year, last year only 4% of people had uh, a day rate that was 200 pounds or less. So clearly a lot more people have been involved. Um, but if we do look just at people who are filled this out uh, because of their association with the APM, the average day rate is £450 a day. Um, which, again, I, uh, that makes sense to me. We, we, we as an organization, we provide lots of uh, contractors, lots of interim staff to our corporate clients. And 450 a day is probably the going rate, is a fair rate for a good professional experienced project manager, project professional. Um, what I did find interesting here is that normally when we're providing interim staff, often uh, that contract is usually for six months um, and is then renewed on, a, on, a, on that six monthly basis. So I would always expect kind of the, the, the majority of people to have a six to 12 month contract. Here we're seeing definitely there's more people have a longer contracts that would suggest to me that uh, a good portion of the people completing this survey are possibly on uh, longer fixed term contracts, which is kind of a, a halfway house uh, between being a, a pure contractor and being a, a pure per member of staff. Um, so if we then look, stay with contractors, and uh, for some of you listening in, I suspect you are contractors, you know, individuals, professionals who have particular project management expertise and will go and work for an organization for six months um, and obviously potentially, hopefully, you know, charging a, uh, a, a nice day rate to do that. Um, uh, the majority of people who, who do that kind of contract interim work have their own limited company and we can see that here, 73%. Last year it was a higher percentage. Uh, last year it was 87%. And again, I think that just reflects the broader scope of this year's survey, more people getting involved. Um, so, um, so if you are a contractor, the majority of people, as I said, have their own limited company. That sometimes feels quite daunting. You need to have an accountant, potentially. Um, uh, that seems a, a good way to do that, get some proper advice. Uh, you may need to be VAT registered. Uh, and immediately that feels, oh my goodness me, that sounds uh, scary and cumbersome. Actually, it's not that difficult to do. Uh, those people who really are uh, not comfortable with that uh, often then do work through what's called an umbrella company instead. Um, so that's a service that does this kind of paperwork for you um, and, uh, and looks after you in that sense, uh, creates the limited company for you. Um, but, um, but yes, most people, surprise, surprise, work through their own limited company. Uh, and, and, and there's always a question about, you know, should I go contracting, stay permanent staff? And I'm actually going to talk about that uh, in a few slides as well. So moving on, uh, job satisfaction. Are we happy with our jobs? Are you sat there all miserable eating chocolate biscuits uh, or are you, um, uh, are you delighted uh, every Monday morning when you jump out of bed? Well, uh, very satisfied, 25%. Uh, uh, last year it was 27%, so pretty much similar. Uh, fairly satisfied, 54%. Last year it was 55%. So the numbers are pretty static compared to last year. Um, no, no huge jumps there. This is the particular favorite of mine, uh, market confidence. Now, bear in mind, this survey took place in April. Uh, so 47% of people thought their organization was growing and looking to recruit staff. That's pretty good numbers. 50% nearly of people think their organization is going to recruit staff. An additional nearly 20% felt that their organization was growing. Um, if I compare this to last year, the main difference is, um, as you can see on the slide, the green and the light blue, which is green 3% this year, anticipating a downturn, but no redundancy. So we're feeling a bit negative, but no one's going to lose their, their job. Um, compared to that 14% think, actually, there are going to be redundancies. Now, if I compare that to last year, those figures were almost flipped the other way around. So last year, 14% thought there were going to be a bit of a downturn, but we're all going to keep our jobs. And only 6% thought there were actually going to be redundancies. So yeah, we can argue there's some more negativity there, 
Um, but on the other side, 47% think we're going to grow and recruit staff. Last year, that was 41%. So uh, that can be taken very much as a positive. Um, if we talk about the future, um, in our crystal ball, uh, there's a lot of cloudiness in the crystal ball at the moment, uh, Brexit being a big key part of that. But if we look on expectations for the future, um, are you likely to change employer in the next 12 months? Well, 13, uh, sorry, 11% said they would this year, last year it was 13%. 16% said fairly likely, uh, rather than, sorry, I just quoted very likely. So fairly likely, 16%, last year that was 20%. Not very likely this year, 34%, last year it was 39%. So we can see here there's a little bit more conservatism coming in, uh, people less likely to want to jump, long, want to look for a new role um, uh, this year compared to last year. And maybe one of the reasons for that is on the right hand side here. Now bear in mind, this survey took place after the uh, results were known um, from the uh, exit vote, uh, but it was before Article 50 was actually, uh, um, we'll say started, I'm not sure that's the right word, but I'm sure you know what I mean. Um, so we can see here, what's the impact? Well, people, um, now the positive or negative, a lot of people don't know, 42%. Um, and of course, there's a, a, a large number there, fairly negative or very negative, fairly negative, 23%, very negative, 13%. And I think that reflects, and I'm certainly not going to get into evolving politics in this webinar, but I think that reflects possibly the uncertainty. And that's the key thing there, particularly at the, you know, if we go back to April, and obviously still today, there's a high degree of uncertainty. Uncertainty causes anxiety, we don't really know. Um, so, so that reflects on those numbers uh, there. So uh, that's the data I'm going to present. The big question is, what the heck does this mean for me? What, what, how does this change my uh, world? So uh, just very briefly on, um, um, should I stay employee or should I go contracting? Uh, if you've seen any of my uh, presentations or webinars before, you may have seen this slide before. There are pros and cons for being an employee versus being a contractor. Employee, I may have more job security. Um, I may have better, well, I'll have benefits, hopefully, health insurance, things like that. Hopefully, I've got an organization that is thinking about my career development, my personal development, paying for me to go and get some training, and I have that sense of belonging to something. As a contractor, I don't have those things. I do have greater flexibility. Um, it's definitely, it's fair to say I'm possibly on a day rate basis going to earn more money. That is, of course, if I'm in a contract. And I always say to people who are contracting, you should have three months of salary saved away because at some point your contract's going to end and you're not necessarily going to walk into another contract the next day. Uh, and I uh, have friends, colleagues, um, uh, people I know who uh, you know, earn fantastic money on a day rate basis, very senior people, but then they'll go six months without a contract. And so it's important that we don't see this figure that we get on that day rate basis, that £400 a day, and we don't multiply it out, so that's about £8,000 a month, which is about £96,000 a year. I hope that math is right, I've just done that off the top of my head. But um, So, you know, these are big numbers for me. Um, bear in mind, uh, you do need to take holiday, you may be, your contract may end, um, you're not getting any benefits, so things like um, health insurance, uh, mobile phone, things like that, you've got to factor those in. And of course, no one else is going to think about your career. So you need to take time out to get those additional qualifications, to get that training. You can't stand still. Uh, and taking a week off to go on a, on a training course, A, you're paying for the course yourself, and B, you're, you're losing that one week of, of day rate. So um, it is important that you, you go into these things with your eyes open in terms of what the true benefit is and what the true cost is of being a contractor versus being an employee. One question that people often ask me is, is what's, what could I earn as a contractor? Uh, what kind of rate could I, uh, could I put myself out there at? I don't want to under, undersell myself. I would, I, equally, I don't want to price myself out of the market. So um, here's a, a simple rule of thumb that I often uh, recommend to people. If you take your permanent salary, divide it by 100, that gives you an approximate day rate. 
that day rate might dip depending on industry depending on region depending on uh, what the client's prepared to pay and the current economic market. So here we're suggesting if you're someone who's, say, a project manager on £46,000 a year, kind of the average, then the day rate might be £460 a day. I might suggest that possibly we take £50 off that, actually, uh, and, um, and make that, say, about £400 a day. Uh, that's a good uh, day rate for a project manager. Um, and uh, so rule of thumb, take your perm salary, divide it by 100, that gives you an approximate, um, and I think that is a good fat, if I can use that term, fat rate, uh, and therefore you may well be happy to take uh, much less than that to get into a role, to get into an organization, to boost your CV uh, as well. So um, uh, the other point I wanted to make is working with agencies, uh, those of you who, whether you're perm or contract, at some point, I'm sure you're going to get a call or I'm sure you're going to be speaking to a recruitment agency. Um, some pointers on that. If you do get calls from a recruitment agency, make sure what they're asking, talking to you about is actually a live role. Um, and it's reasonable for you to ask some very direct questions. Have you recruited for this organization before? A lot of large corporates have a preferred supplier list, a PSL. So use that terminology. Are you on the PSL for this uh, organization? If you have an agency that's asking you for references, I think it's worth querying that. Um, the first thing I would say is, in a, if you're going for a permanent role, it's actually the hiring organization that would follow up your references. If you're going for a contract role, then it is the agency that would take up your references. But I wouldn't expect them to do that on their first call with you. And I have to say, there is, unfortunately, some elements uh, within the recruitment industry that might use your references to then sell their services to those people. So just be careful before you give out your reference details to an agency, just to understand, is it appropriate at this stage in our relationship, um, in this stage of the recruitment, to actually do that? Uh, the final point is well about rate. Uh, and again, this is particularly true, uh, for, well, it is only true for contract roles. Um, agencies should be very transparent about their fees and what they're charging. And if they're on a PSL, that is obviously uh, negotiated already. Um, so we as an organization, we're a preferred supplier to say, uh, one of our clients is a GlaxoSmithKline. I'm not saying anything's confidential to them, but we have an agreed percentage rate. So when we provide one of uh, a contractor into them, we already know, they already know what the, uh, the, the percentage fee for our services is on top of that. If you've got a, a, an agency that's not willing to talk about that or tells you not to talk about rate at interview, uh, that suggests to me they, they've taken your rate and added an awful lot to it and seen what they can get out of it. So you're quite within your rights to talk about the rate at interview with the client. Um, so, so do bear that in mind as well. Uh, so finally, uh, project management. Is it the right career for you? Well, the first thing I would say is that project management isn't just about being a project manager. There are lots of other career opportunities. Uh, to be a project manager, you have to have a certain personality. You need to be able to bring people along with you. You need to, to uh, enthuse people and gain confidence. That might not fit your personality. Um, I have some friends uh, who are planning engineers uh, and work in the oil and gas industry uh, and focus on uh, using scheduling tools to plan huge capital projects. They don't want to be project managers, and to be fair to them, they possibly don't have the personality uh, to be a, a project manager, but they're much more uh, keen to do uh, the role of planner or planner engineer. Equally, I mentioned being a head of PMO or um, uh, a change manager. So there are other opportunities within the industry. Qualifications, there's loads of qualifications out there. The APM, of course, have the full range of qualifications for project managers, uh, and that's going to be extended, and obviously, with the Royal Charter status. Um, so there's definitely an opportunity there for you to get a professional qualification. If this is your career, why wouldn't you have that professional qualification? I've mentioned networking opportunities already. Uh, do look beyond your organization. It, um, I spend most of my time helping clients, helping organizations improve their project management maturity. And the biggest thing I bring to that party is knowledge about what works and what organizations are doing uh, and what good looks like. 
So do look beyond your own organization. If your organization has room for improvement, and um, but frankly, most do, um, it is worthwhile you engaging with your profession to see how other people tackle the same challenges. Whether I'm a car manufacturer, building hospitals, or building nuclear submarines, the tools and techniques of project management are universal, which bring me to my final point on this slide. As a project manager, your skills are highly transferable. Um, it is reasonable for a good project manager to move industry. Now, often as a project manager, we're also wearing the hat of a subject matter expert, but the tools and techniques of project management are universal. A good project manager can add value on any project, and therefore, from a career perspective, don't just think about your industry, it's a natural place to sit, but there are industri industries where project management is less mature. And those industries are actually recruiting people from industries where project management is more mature. And I've got some great case studies where, um, for as example, we had oil and gas project managers recruited by a pharmaceutical company. Um, I've got other examples of uh, project managers being recruited into the legal profession. These are industries which are embracing project management, are waking up to the benefits of it, and therefore need to bring in um, uh, those skills. Um, so um, we'll look outside their industry for expertise. That's not true for every industry, but it's certainly an opportunity there as well. So the um, final point I'll make is, uh, obviously we're a recruitment consultancy. If you are interested in looking at new opportunities, do go to our website, uh, Wellington, with an E on the end, wellington.co.uk. You will see a list of live jobs. If you'd like to submit your CV, fabulous. We, we would definitely like to receive that from you. Um, very happy to talk to people as well uh, in terms of career development. No, we don't charge uh, to look at your CV. Uh, I know some people do do that. I don't think that's really fair from a recruitment agency perspective. Uh, but, but because we're not just a recruitment agency, in fact, we're a, a very large consultancy. We're a Microsoft Gold Partner. Uh, and we're a Microsoft, um, sorry, an APM accredited training provider. We do lots of other things as well. So do feel free to register for our webinars on um, uh, on all sorts of topics. Um, the state of project management is also a survey you can download from our website uh, as well, which gives you great insight into the industry. And the final thing I'm going to mention, if I may, about Wellington is we are doing our own conference. Um, uh, PMO event, future PMO. It's happening on the 12th of September. And in fact, on this webinar, we are uh, providing a 15% discount uh, for tickets. Um, there is going to be a DeLorean. There is going to be a, pro a project manager robot from the future. Uh, but there's also going to be lots of great speakers as well from some of the UK's leading organizations. Um, and a real opportunity, again, to network uh, and interact with people. So if you are involved in the PMO, please do come along. And this slide gives you an opportunity to um, get a discount on tickets as well. Now, I think that's me done. I may have overrun slightly. I apologize if I have. Um, but uh, there was an opportunity, I think, to ask questions as we go along. Uh, Nathaniel, Nathaniel, my colleague from the APM, uh, is there behind the scenes. And uh, Nathaniel, do we have any questions that are worth looking at uh, that we uh, need to put me on the spot with? Hey, Vince. Um, thanks for your presentation. We, we've got a couple of questions, not as many as I thought we'd get. Um, that's fine. <laughs> Fine. So if I start us off with a question that relates to uh, one of your recently made points, which is we've, we've got a gentleman who's working in the oil and gas sector. They've got quite a lot of PM experience, eight years plus, and both academic and professional qualifications. But all their experience and their sort of knowledge of salary ranges is within that oil and gas sector. They're thinking of moving out of it, moving from a steady role to consultant role, uh, it's not something they've done before, is there any advice that you could provide them in terms of expected realistic scales for a salary for someone who, who you would describe really as an ex a, a middle to senior experience uh, for a project manager? Yeah, there's a couple of things to talk about here. First of all, oil and gas industry, obviously as the oil price comes up, uh, the demand increases, uh, oil and gas industry at the moment is, uh, is depressed. 
Um, there are people coming out of that industry. Um, and so really potentially what we might be looking at here is, is moving away from the oil and gas industry and also going from perm, I think you mentioned possibly more to a contract role. Now the thing, the first thing I would say on, on a CV, if you are going to look at roles outside your industry, take the industry terminology out of your CV and um, uh, make it much more generic. You know, team leadership is team leadership. Managing a plan is managing a plan. So take out that industry terminology and demonstrate the real transferable skills that you have, that you will, that you do have, and the qualifications really help as well. Um, so that's the first thing. The the other thing then is in terms of rate. Uh, I mean, the average rate, as I mentioned on these slides, is about four fifty a day. I think you know, for our first role, uh, you particularly if it isn't a new industry, I think you might say I am prepared to take less to get myself into that industry, to get that opportunity. Um, it may well be the first step might be to do a contract type role within your industry or very related um, to build up that um, that on your CV. And this is what we're trying to do, we're trying to build your CV. What I would say is when you do leave that a role, if that role, you know, I, I don't like looking at a CV and seeing someone that's moved once every six months or three months or four months, you want to say, well, why are they keep moving? So when you do start building that up, do put on your CV uh, details of why you've left a role. And it might be because the project's finished. And this is the thing about project management, projects do finish, hopefully. Um, so it's important to, to signpost that on a CV. Uh, but going back to the point, oil and gas, very mature project management. There's definitely a lot to offer other industries. Um, uh, closer related, the better, clearly engineering, um, uh, utilities, in particular, uh, jump uh, in my mind. Uh, but I would say you might want to take a slight hit on the day rate uh, to get that first roll. Um, hopefully that gives some guidance um, uh, for that uh, for that question. Any, any other questions, Nathaniel? Thanks, Vince. Um, we've got three questions that all relate to salaries that a project sponsor is likely to earn in relation to the salaries of staff on a project. Now, I know our <laughs> survey isn't really looking at the, the sponsor side of things too much, but do you have any, any guidance yeah. you can give on that? That's interesting. So sp project sponsorship, uh, what is that? So that's the person, let's look at the definition. As a project sponsor is someone who owns the business case and uh, wants a project delivered and finds the poor project manager to deliver it they are the point of escalation for a project manager. Often, they are the line manager of the project manager in most organizations. Um, not always the case, of course. And actually, a sign of a very mature organization is when they're not. But for a lot of organizations, the sponsor is the line manager, head of department uh, from which the project managers come. So yes, they are going to be more senior. That's a given. Um, how does their salary compare? Um, it, as you said, as you said, Nathaniel, we don't actually have stats on on the the, the average salary of a sponsor. Uh, and to be honest, that could be anything. It is about being a it is a a decision maker, a senior manager in an organisation. I wouldn't want to say I'd expect it to be ten percent, fifteen percent, twenty five percent more than a project manager, but it is more of a um, it could because anyone could be a sponsor, but it is more uh, about. Uh, being a, uh, I say normally, quite often, the line manager, the project manager, so it is the next level up in terms of management. Um, and and I've, m most of my clients, it's that kind of level where people have sponsorship. For others, because the sponsor may also be the budget holder, they could actually end up being someone quite senior indeed, and we might end up looking at that £125,000 scale. Um, so unfortunately, it's not a simple answer to that question. Uh, what I would say, sponsor is more senior, often the line manager. If I've got a project manager on forty-six thousand uh, pounds, a sponsor could be sixty thousand um, pounds. But it does really range because anyone really, uh, the the amount of people who could be a sponsor is very broad. So not to to skirt around the answer, skirt around the question, but that's that's going to be my answer, I'm afraid. Any others, Nathaniel? Thank you, Vince. Another question relating directly to salary splits is, um, can you sort of explain the, the percentage scale between your senior project managers, your project managers, and your junior project managers or assistant 
project managers and is there a big split as people progress up the levels of responsibility yeah I, and that, that's the key word isn't it level of responsibility so uh, in terms of career development um, the key thing I always say to people is you want to get to a position where you're you're asking for responsibility as you get more responsibility you can legitimately say you are a, uh, a you know a project manager um, so it, it, that transition from being a project coordinator to a project manager it is more about uh, responsibility than anything else however let's have a look um, so I'm just gone back to the slide assistant project manager 32,500 whereas a project manager is 47,500 now project manager as you mentioned there we could have junior project manager um, and I would sit I would say that's between those two elements of 32 to 47 um, so I'll go 32 to 45 for a, for a junior project manager senior project manager is probably going to be 50 to 65 and that's based on my own view that isn't based on any data in front of me um, and of course a, a you know a very senior project manager if I'm running a very very large project that is the equivalent of being a program manager uh, the difference between a project and a program, you know, we've got that in the textbook, but for a lot of organizations, that's a fairly gray area. Is it a very big project or a small program? Uh, and we could argue it either way. Um, but uh, program manager is 62. So I would say a senior project manager, in my expectation, would probably be 50 to 65, that kind of range. Um, I know some who are on higher than that, and that reflects the scale, the magnitude of the project uh, that they are running. And at this point, you're not running projects, you're running a very big, uh, sexy project. So hopefully that provides some guidance. In summary, I would say junior project manager, um, I would be looking at uh, 35 to 45, 32 to 45. Uh, senior project manager, probably, as I mentioned, you know, up to 60, uh, 65, uh, something like that. Thank you, Vince. Another question that's come in is, um, let, me, let me get the wording right, is there a big split in salary between sectors where project management as a profession is, is recognised and established and between sectors where it's just starting to develop? That's a very good question. My answer is actually, I, I, I know, but the challenge is greater. If I'm a, an expert project manager and I walk into an organization where everyone knows what the role project manager is and the organization has a project management methodology and it has a standard reporting life cycle and it might have a PMO and I walk in and say, right, I'm going to run this project and the organization says, great, here's our approach, here's our project methodology, here's our project documents. That's a very different experience to going into an organization that has none of that, that doesn't have a PMO that might have a little bit of you know a document template a scoping document that they don't understand project management uh, you are fighting the machine more so i think the difference isn't really salary i think the difference is more about the challenge and um it could make it a lot more exciting so for example i uh, myself i'm doing a lot of work at the moment with uh, clients in the legal profession and I mentioned this earlier on, the legal profession is embracing uh, project management. And uh, it's kind of the new frontier, in, in my mind, of, of project management. Um, and so there's, uh, there's an opportunity there to, to um, s yeah, there's quite a challenge there. If, if you're a, a project management expert, expert, you're kind of teaching that to your, your uh, senior managers. Um, so I think the challenge is different. Uh, I don't think I could give a salary difference but I would say it's a very different role. It's a very um, much more exciting place to be in the sense of uh, you, uh, you're going to be selling project management as much as anything else. Um, so again, that doesn't suit everybody, but uh, uh, um, there's, there's good opportunity there. So I, again, I apologize for skirting your, your question, but I think it's more about what my day-to-day -day is going to be like. And in an organization that's, you know, say oil and gas, we know what a schedule is, we know what risk management is. Uh, you're going to be making sure you work to the standards of that organization. That, the, the, in, in, in other worlds where it's much more immature, you might be the person defining those standards, which could be very exciting, could be quite daunting, um, and uh, doesn't suit everybody. Uh, Nathaniel, any other questions? 
Yes, thank you, Vince. There's two questions which I'll I'll ask you both in a row because they're they're both linked to people trying to enter the profession of project management. So, yeah. first question: We've got someone who's an experienced engineer, but they're not a project manager. They don't have project management experience on their CV, but they they've got the engineering experience and they'd like to move into the profession. How do they start structuring? their CV, what type of um, roles should they look to apply for? And I think quite linked to this, we've got, we've got a question from someone who describes themselves as a young person listening to this webinar because they're interested in project management. They have no prior PM experience and are looking to build up a CV with experience that should help them get a full-time paid role. Where, so I guess for both guys, how would you recommend that they position their CVs and where should they be applying to build up that experience? Yeah, good questions. Uh, that's a question we get quite a lot. The first thing I would say is the majority of people in the UK who run projects are, uh, we term them SMEs, subject matter experts. So I'm an expert in engineering. I'm an expert in IT systems. I'm an expert in finance. And then I get a project. And almost my interest comes away from that subject matter expertise into being a professional project manager. So I'd say for both those people, they're uh, in their job at the moment, in their role at the moment, let's talk about the first one, say I'm an engineer, you will be doing some project management. It might be called project management, but you'll be doing some. Uh, and I think the first step is to see if you can get the opportunity to do more of that in your current role. Can I manage this piece of work for a client? Can I look after the budget? Can I manage a team of two people? Can I work to a deadline? Um, those are things that are project management. You know, I completed this piece of work. I'm the engineer on it. We hit the deadline. I was involved in making sure that we hit the deadline and that my two colleagues knew what they needed to do by what date. Guess what? You're a project manager. So I, I, I always say to people, see if you can increase the amount of project management in your current role. Ask to take on that responsibility. Ask to take ownership, and that's the key word here, you know, ownership of a piece of work. Um, if you can then marry that up with a professional qualification, which you might, you, know, you might have to pay for it yourself if your organization doesn't see you going down that route, what that always demonstrates to me is someone's commitment. You know, I've got this role. I've done as much project management as I can and in it, and I've also gone off and say got the, the APM PFQ, the, the Project Fundamentals Qualification, that's a two-day course with a um, one-hour multiple choice exam at the end. Um, that demonstrates that interest, and I think it's about transitioning, uh, trying to take on that responsibility, then your CV, as I mentioned earlier on, rather than your CV being filled with uh, industry uh, jargon, um, you can talk about the fact that you led a team that you hit a deadline, that you manage the budget on something. You might not have the job title project manager, but you can explain and show, demonstrate how your role does involve project management. And that might give you your first opportunity. If your own organization isn't interested in you, you know, taking that route, then that gives you an opportunity possibly to go somewhere else. You might take a, a parallel move or, or uh, maybe for some people in you know, a slight salary reduction to get that role that gives you that opportunity. And there's nothing wrong with saying, I'm very passionate about being a project manager. I've gone off and got some qualifications myself. I've got as much as I can out of my current role in project management. However, that's what's holding me back. I want this opportunity. Um, and if you look for an organization that is looking for a, a subject matter expert who's going to run projects and um, and that organization is looking for someone who's got your technical background, that's going to be a great fit. So, um, so I think in both situations, it's about looking at what you're doing at the moment and seeing how much of that is project management, and you'll probably be surprised. You know, yeah, I am. I'm working as part of a team. I'm communicating what we're doing. I'm looking after a budget. And, uh, and that's true whether I'm doing organizing my sister's wedding, my kitchen refit, or whatever, the tools and techniques of project management can be applied. And so it's making sure that you emphasize that as much as possible in a generic way in your CV starts to explain that story. And enthusiasm, you know, I've interviewed many, many, many people, and one of the key things I always look for is enthusiasm. If I'm, someone's enthusiastic about it, and I want to do that role, and I can demonstrate some transferable skills, I have an opportunity, particularly at a more junior level. Um, uh, so, Nathaniel, hopefully that gives some guidance. Um, any other questions? 
Thanks, Vince. I think we've got time for two more questions. Uh, both of them related really to entering into the profession and, and your yeah. CV. So first question, we've got someone who has stepped down into a more junior role specifically to get PM experience, they obviously really want to work in this sector. Should yep. they state their salary on their CV because they no. feel that the salary doesn't reflect their experience? No, never, and it's standard, never, ever, ever state your salary on a CV. And in fact, if you're an interview and someone asks you your salary, you don't actually have to answer that question. You could be cute with your answer, but you, or you are going to put yourself at disadvantage um, if you say, yeah, I'm currently on £25,000 a year. How on earth do you expect someone to give you a job on £40,000 a year? They're not. They're going to say, well, they're happy to work at 25. We'll give them 27. So never put your salary on your um, CV, contract or perm. And at interview, if someone asks you what's your current salary, you can turn that around and say, say could it may I ask what this role is paying? You don't need to state your salary. Now, you don't want to create a, you know, a, a difficult moment in your interview, um, but you can, you, I, I've interviewed some people who do this in a very cute way, and they say, I'm, I'm much more interested in about my future. Uh, what does this role offer? What can you offer me? Um, uh, can you tell me what the, um, uh, what the role salary range is? So it's turning it back onto the employer uh, on the interviewer, um, and uh, as I said, you're not obliged to say what your current salary is. So, so certainly don't put it on your CV. And if you're asked, um, you don't have to answer. Um, you can say, I'm more interested in what this role offers, and if it offers a salary that um, you can say, and people often say, you know, it's not the salary that I'm driving me. It is the role. I'm more. I am quite flexible on the salary because it's the role is so important to me. Um, and then if they do say, well, you know, really you know, hold you to it, what are you looking for? Then do say, well, I'm looking for, and then you can state the range that you think you're worth or you think this job will pay. You know, uh, you say, for example, at the moment you're on 25,000 pounds a year, you think the role is about 35, you, you would be quite within your right to say, well, I am looking for between 32, 36, something like that. Um, don't overprice yourself, but don't feel obliged to state what you're currently on. Thank you, Vince. And the final question, um, is there a qualification or a set of qualifications that you'd recommend for someone starting out in the profession? So this is someone without prior experience. Yeah, the, the obvious intro uh, uh, qualification is, and I mentioned it already actually, the APM uh, PFQ, Project Fundamentals Qualification. So the APM has a set range of qualifications for different levels of seniority. And um, these align with the IPMA as well, so international body. And um, so the first of those is a two-day course with a one-hour multiple choice paper. And what that is testing is your knowledge. Uh, the syllabus is about 70% of the APM's body of knowledge. So the body of knowledge, if you go to apm.org.uk, uh, I think you can download the, the body of knowledge. Um, and um, uh, it's a book, and it's a book that it talks about the best practice project management. So, so you're being judged on that, and that's the uh, easiest qualification, the simplest qualification, the shortest qualification, the uh, probably in the cheapest qualification um, in terms of time investment and so on. So that's a great place to start. It's a very well-rounded start point. Um, I would definitely recommend that. I'm, I'm conscious that the organisation I'm from is a Microsoft Gold partner. I will state that. The other thing I would, however, state. 98% of people who run projects do use Microsoft Project. Uh, other market, other tools are available on the marketplace, uh, but also becoming very skilled in uh, Excel and, and Microsoft Project. Those tools that people tend to use in running projects, I, I would also recommend that as well. Um, so you have some practical tools you can offer. Uh, you know, yes, I can build a plan. Uh, I can build a schedule, and uh, I understand what critical path is. Uh, is, is a great starting combination of skills. Um, so, um, yeah, the first qualification I'd say APM, uh, PFQ, and if you go to the APM's website, um, there's lots of guidance on, on that qualification and, and how you can take that qualification uh, as well.